I've been feeling weird I can't seem to focus good enough Nothing's really clear Sometimes it could be a little tough I just need to feel like the end's in sight for me But let's be really real anxiety can fog me up Sebastian Federal Prodigy World Champion Ferrari Savior Spinner Lance Stroll Mentor it doesn't matter in which of these statuses you found Sebastian when you started following him and his career. He would hardly leave you indifferent. Due to his performances or due to his specific charisma, Vettel certainly made you into his fan or his hater. But the current F1 season starts without Sebastian on the grid. Before covering his racing style in detail, let's start with looking throughout his career, his place in F1 history and how both Vettel himself and people's attitude towards him have changed over time. Let's go! I got nightmares in my head, I fear That the thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Greetings, dear motorsportsmen, and I'm really pleased to see you in this new video format. In here we'll discuss the history of F1, and this video is made more in the form of a podcast, so feel free to just listen to it in the background while doing your other things, but you can still watch it as a regular video, because you still have some valuable info on your screen. And also this video opens a Sebastian Vettel trilogy. In this first video we will discuss first part of Vettel's career in detail. In the second video we will do the complete driving style breakdown. And in the third, in the last video, we will discuss the second part of Sebastian Vettel's career. So the plan is grand, let's start. Vettel's career, like a career of pretty much every F1 driver of the last, I don't know, 30 years, started with karting. And we actually see that it is quite similar to his F1 career. A complete dominance in the beginning and some troubles in the middle and then again challenging for the wins. Sebastian attracted Red Bull as his sponsor already in his second year in 1998 and it's clearly a very early sponsorship. And in the year 2001 he already became a member of Red Bull Junior Racing Academy. So you see complete dominance in those bambini kids classes. Then two not so successful years in junior karting, but then a superior 2001 season. The most interesting point about Sebastian's karting career is that he got his Red Bull sponsorship really early, maybe even earlier than Lewis Hamilton got his McLaren sponsorship. But it is Lewis, not Vettel, who is known for his early sponsor acquisition. Now, moving towards his open wheels career, he made his debut in 2003 and in his very first season managed to score 5 wins, take the second place in the championship. But of course, the second year was a complete dominance. 18 wins out of 20 races. Just a stellar performance. And you may argue that he was placed in the best car, but Formula BMW is mono serious. It means that all cars are the same. So the car difference is out of the equation. Then here 2005, Vettel started trying himself in several different F3 championships, not so successful besides the Macau Grand Prix, but we know that Macau Grand Prix is a one-time show-off, so the results tend to be pretty random. Then year 2006, quite a successful season in F3, but he didn't manage to become an F3 champion. And guess who became champion that year? Paul DiResta. It's quite interesting to see how their careers developed later on. And then in 2007, only 7 races in Formula Renault. 3.5 and then an F1 debut. Debut in BMW Zauber, not in Toro Rosso. So let's make a quick summary of his early career. 
of his way towards F1, his career was quite successful. Not as successful as, for example, Lewis Hamilton's career, but he still managed to establish himself like one of the main talents of his generation. Plus, he has formed quite a strong relationships with both BMW and Red Bull, which guaranteed his F1 debut. Sebastian Vettel entered 2007 in a role of BMW Zauber test driver. Villeneuve left the team, Robert Kubica took his place as a racing driver and Vettel took Robert Kubica's place as a testing and a reserve driver. By the way, Robert Kubica is another great talent of that generation and if not a tragical rally incident that happened with him, we would definitely have one more experienced driver in the age of 35, 37, 38 years old. Also, it's fair to say that debuting from the role of reserve driver, of the role of test driver, back in 2007 was quite easier than it is now, due to the fact that Private testing was not limited, simulators were only making their appearance, were only entering the F1 world and were not so significant. Teams still relied mainly on real-life testing, which resulted in reserve test drivers having way more actual experience in current F1 car than they have nowadays. A huge accident happened to Robert Kubica in Canada, which resulted in him missing the next Indianapolis GP, that's where Sebastian made his debut. The youngest F1 driver, the youngest point scorer, the youngest F1 driver to receive a penalty, that were the records that were set by Sebastian. And besides the fact that some of them were beaten later on, it's still quite an early debut, especially considering the timeline. Now, if we talk about debut itself, it was a complete success, a good qualifying and, despite having a small issue on the first lap, Vettel managed to finish in 8th place and score a point in his first ever F1 race. Proving to everybody that he definitely deserves a place in F1 cockpit and a bit later this year he got his place, but not in BMW, they were not ready to provide him with an F1 seat. But Red Bull, who had the junior team already, provided Sebastian with an F1 seat. After some physical altercations with involvement of Scott Speed, Sebastian Vettel appeared as a full-time Toro Rosa racing driver starting from Hungarian Grand Prix. Now, Sebastian's Toro Rosa chapter begins. And of course, if we talk about Vettel in Toro Rosa, everyone will remember his Monza win. But he had some other strong performances, first one being Fuji race in Japan, when both qualifying and race had some heavy wet conditions, and at that time Vettel was really good in those wet conditions, an ability that seemed to disappear towards his later stages of career, but early Sebastian was pretty fast under the rain. Strong qualifying, even stronger race, at some point he was taking a third place. But then a first episode of his Mark Webber rivalry occurred. Sebastian on a junior team car managed to crash into the main team car of Red Bull under safety car conditions, which should be at least unpleasant for Red Bull. No one wants your junior driver crashing into your senior driver. Sebastian Vettel received a 10 place grid penalty for following race, but this penalty was reverted due to the fact that stewards watched a fan video from YouTube. So in some ways stewards were doing a better job in those days. And on the following weekend in China one more pretty strong performance. Despite being outqualified by his teammate, his race pace was stronger and he managed to score a P4 
finish. So 2007 appears to be one of the best F1 debuts in history. Of course, excluding, for example, Lewis Hamilton debut season, but debuting in a top team is still a nonsense, is still one in a lifetime event. So if we talk about realistic debuts in some smaller teams, his first year was perfect. Moving on to 2008, and the car was quite weak during several first weekends, but starting from the Monaco GP, the new car was brought by Scuderia Toro Rosso, and Vettel managed just flying away with it, scoring points in practically every race afterwards, and of course scoring his legendary Monza victory. And here I will try to confront the public opinion, because people tend to say that during this weekend Sebastian showed that he is levels above every other driver by scoring a win with Toro Rosso, but I do not agree with this opinion. Yes, he showed that he is a top driver, that he is capable of race winning, but Toro Rosso car during this weekend really had the chances to score a win. Sebastian Bourdais managed to take P4 in qualifying and also a lot of mistakes were made by the competitors. For example, Hamilton didn't score a victory due to a wrong tire choice. What I'm trying to say that it's still a great, great performance, but definitely not something impossible happened. In these terms, Pierre Gasly's win in Monza looks quite more impossible, if you ask me. But also much more luck was involved in that win. So it is a sort of a two-edged sword. From the one side, Vettel's win involved less luck, so it is not as outstanding, but on the other side, this exact fact of lesser luck involvement makes this win more sort of real. But still, to the point of Monza victory, Red Bull transfer was already announced and here the brightest chapter of Sebastian's career starts. But before proceeding to Red Bull chapter, let's discuss young Vettel's image and people's attitude towards him. And I would not lie if I'll tell you that people generally loved Sebastian. He was a good-looking young man, but what's more important, he was a fast racing driver. His debut made a final proof that you can easily put young drivers straight into the mix. His example and example of Lewis Hamilton show that this approach is more effective than, for example, Felipe Massa's approach or even Fernando Alonso's approach, when they were held as a reserve driver for several years, where they were held in slower teams for longer. And of course, the pinnacle of this approach is Max Verstappen's debut, which came several years later. And at that point, the only source of critic was also Sebastian Vettel's young age. But his results spoke for themselves and were proven that critics were wrong. So now Red Bull chapter and it started with year 2009. A historical year, a year of Brown GP miracle directly connected with engineering innovation of double diffuser. Brown GP ended up dominating the first half of the season and falling off later on due to financial problems and Red Bull was the team to pick up the flag, but it still was not enough for them to capture world title. Some people tend to criticize Vettel for this year, saying that if some better performances he could already become a champion in 2009, but I tend to disagree with it. The final difference in points is still quite significant, and let's add up the fact that Jensen Button struggled to extract the most out of his car in the second half of the season. In fact, Rubens Barrichello was the fastest driver in Brown GP in the end of the season, which means that Brown GP car was potentially even faster. Now, we go further and we enter the 2010 season. In my personal opinion, it is the best season in 21st century and also quite a remarkable for F1 history. Several significant changes hit F1. The first and the main change is cancellation of refueling. Refueling was not a part of the game 
in F1 anymore. The second remarkable event was a return of Michael Schumacher, the legend. And many people, including myself, supposed that it was better for him not to make a comeback. He completely lost all three seasons in Mercedes to Nico Rosberg, which damaged his legacy, at least in eyes of some portion of F1 fans. And the fact is that in 2010 F1 became to transform in its modern stage, cancellation of refueling, strict limitations of private tests, simulators finally became the main working tool for teams and also DRS will be introduced after the year 2010 and will be connected with this particular season. Despite it being so intriguing, the pure number of overtakes was quite small and this low ability to overtake even influenced the outcome of World Championship. So after this year DRS was introduced and Michael Schumacher simply didn't fit into this new F1. He faced some troubles using simulators and also his age just caught up with him. The third remarkable event is debut of three new F1 teams. So the number of available seats in F1 grew up significantly. And the fourth remarkable change is the change to the points scoring system. So you start seeing the traits of modern F1, but the season itself was just spectacular. Three teams, Red Bull, Ferrari and McLaren, looked similar in terms of their abilities to win races in terms of the speed. In the first stage, Red Bull and McLaren looked the fastest and in the second stage Red Bull and Ferrari looked the fastest. For the whole season we used to have five title contenders, with Jensen Button falling off a bit towards the later stages, but towards the final Grand Prix we had four drivers with potential chances to seize the World Cup. Also the infamous okay, so Fernando is faster than you. incident took place during this season and quite uncommonly Mark Webber was leading the charge for Red Bull. Sebastian Vettel managed to become the leader of World Championship only in the very last GP. And of course, the last two wins were the decider and the timeline of the last race is just historical. Fernando Alonso and Mark Webber were the main contenders for the World Championship, but Sebastian managed to take pole position, so he was leading the race from the start, but Ferrari team just didn't take him into account. They were trying to mirror Mark Webber's tactics, which resulted in them both getting stuck in the traffic. Vitaly Petrov just refused to let Alonso by, was defending like it was his last race, and those extraordinary circumstances provided Sebastian Vettel with his first driver's world championship taken in the last race. And now we proceed to year 2011 and I pretty much want to unite it with year 2013 because they both looked pretty similar. A complete dominance from Sebastian Vettel and Red Bull car. Obviously, the car was pretty superior during those two, but not four years. And also, it is worth mentioning that Mark Webber still didn't manage to become even vice champion in this car. Most fans consider this season being sort of boring, and it is partially truth. Wanting dominance is never good for overall interest level towards F1, and especially if teammates are not close in terms of speed. By the way, we're risking to get such a season this year. Nevertheless, Sebastian Vettel's style was formed in those two seasons, and I'm not talking about driving style, we will talk about driving style next week. I am talking about winning style. Qualifying victory, then starting the race from pole, a couple of really, really fast laps, breaking the DRS gap and then just disappearing at a sunset, leading the race comfortably, managing the gap, controlling the pace and victory is achieved. Pretty boring to watch, but pretty effective in use. And Sebastian became a master of 
such wins, so I guess we can even call such victory a Sebastian Vettel style victory. Now let's talk about the legendary 2012 season. And the main theme of this season is Red Bull vs Ferrari, Vettel vs Alonso and a superior skill vs superior car as lots of people tend to believe, but I highly doubt this hypothesis and I'll try to explain you why. An incredible start of the season, 7 different winners in first 7 races. Jensen Button, Fernando Alonso, Nico Rosberg his first win, then Sebastian Vettel, Pastor Maldonado his first and his only win, then Mark Webber and Lewis Hamilton. And now it is worth mentioning that both Ferrari and Red Bull didn't look strong in the beginning of the year. And in fact Ferrari even scored the first win earlier than Red Bull. Second race versus fourth race and also the first driver to score two wins was Fernando Alonso. So it is highly debatable which car was really slower, especially considering both quality and race pace. Now let's compare both drivers head to head and we see that Alonso started to break away after the first third of the season. But then Sebastian Vettel and obviously Red Bull managed to do this insane hot streak. Four wins in a row, putting him in a dominant position. Namely, Alonso is known for overcoming circumstances in this season. But I'm stating that Sebastian didn't face much less diversity. Firstly, he had to do this incredible streak, and then the amount of problems that he faced during the last three GPs and the amount of diversity he had to overcome is quite huge. In Abu Dhabi he had to start from a pit lane and faced a necessity to make a breakthrough. But during this breakthrough he got involved in a quite unlucky incident with Toro Rosso driver, a sort of karma refund maybe, fell down the order and had to start his breakthrough all over again. But he got a bit lucky with a second safety car, so he went away pretty much unscathed and was able to minimize his losses. And the last race of the season was legendary. Sebastian Vettel got spinned on the starting lap. He didn't spin by himself like he used to do in his later career stages. He got spinned. His car was damaged, but he was still able to continue. He needed to perform a breakthrough again. Then his own team got in his way, they made a wrong decision to put on slick tires, so then they had to do an extra pit stop, which was also extended due to the fact that needed tires just was not ready. Also, Sebastian had a radio issue and couldn't communicate properly with his team. But despite all those circumstances, all the odds going against him, he managed to take a needed position and become a world champion. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to devalue Fernando's performance and his astonishing season, I just address this narrative that Ferrari car was significantly slower than Red Bull. This narrative is wrong, but still Alonso managed to perform this season may still be considered as the best season in his career, which is already quite remarkable. And Alonso also managed to look strong in comparison with his teammate Felipe Massa. But Felipe's bad performances during those years are quite explainable. Firstly, his head trauma. Secondly, Ferrari that even till nowadays are leading the field in terms of driver's separation on first number, second number, so Felipe's performances are quite explainable. Moreover, this narrative in many ways was created by Fernando himself in countless interviews. But I really want to ask you, was Ferrari as slow as Fernando pretended? My answer will be that even if Ferrari was slower, those two cars, Red Bull and Ferrari, were still in the same league and Ferrari was still able to compete. And now let's talk about how people treated Sebastian, how they referred to him in those brilliant championship years. 
and the situation turned upside down. People just hated Sebastian. I mean, yeah, there were some small groups of new established fans that started to watch F1 during those Red Bull years and even smaller groups of fans that were able to appreciate the rise of Red Bull that could saw beauty in their innovative approach and how this approach matched with Sebastian Vettel. But those groups of people were heavily outnumbered by old-school original fans who didn't like the fact that some soda company appeared in F1 and suddenly started to outperform manufacturer teams. Teams that are based on car producing companies and concerns. Teams that were there since the beginning of ages. And this sort of old school versus new school confrontation was the first reason for majority of people to hate Sebastian Vettel. The second reason is of course connected with the first one, but is more sort of personal, personal rivalry between Sebastian Vettel and Fernando Alonso. Fernando was fan's favorite for his whole career, and this rivalry with Sebastian was heavily heated by Fernando. In countless interviews he didn't miss a chance to poke Sebastian and to underline his dominant car. As he would say. Sebastian Vettel has won his four consecutive titles at the same time before Alain had even won his first Grand Prix. But do you put Sebastian into the same category as Alain Prost and Ayrton Senna? I don't know, time will tell us when uh, he will have a car like the others. If he wins, uh, he will be one of the legends in Formula One. When one day he has a car like the others and he is uh, fourth, fifth, seventh, these four titles will be bad news for him because people will will take these four titles even in a worse manner than what they are doing now. So there are interesting times for Sebastian coming. Moreover, in those times you may actually hear how Fernando would praise Lewis Hamilton, of course, in comparison with Sebastian Vettel. You said that Sebastian is not on the same level as Lewis is. Can you explain that? I think. Uh, I I know Luis maybe better than than Sebastian, uh, being teammates and uh, in McLaren and uh, racing maybe a couple of more years together. So in those years I saw Luis winning races with not maybe the best car. I saw Luis doing performance, amazing performance when uh, sometimes he was not uh, uh, a competitive car in the hands and. Uh, these things, at the moment, we didn't see with Sebastian. Yes, the only difference. They are two great champions. They are uh, the two main rivals, and they are the two most talented drivers in in the grid now. But we, I still miss this this performance from from Sebastian when maybe the Red Bull is ready to do eighth or seventh. Uh, when I see Sebastian winning the race uh, or being in the podium, that will be that will put him at, thing at the same level of, of Luis. So, from public point of view, Fernando Alonso was hardworking, struggling with his car, but extremely skillful driver. While Sebastian Vettel was more of driver with some flaws, but with a dominant car. I hugely and heavily disagree with this statement. Sebastian Vettel in his prime, in Red Bull cockpit and with double or blown diffuser, was the fastest driver on the whole grid. The connection between the car and his driving style was just perfect. There were a lot of weekends when Sebastian appeared to be just in a different league compared to everyone else, including his teammate. While Mark Webber was fighting for the second position with other cars and his Red Bull didn't look superior, Sebastian Vettel was just skyrocketing in half a minute maybe in front of the whole fight. And here we smoothly flow to the third reason of why people hated Sebastian. And it is of course his rivalry with Mark Webber. Everyone supposed that Red Bull strictly prefers Sebastian to Mark that he gets some unfair and undeserved preferences and it is the main reason for such a huge speed difference. But again, these first and second driver talks in many ways 
was seeded and promoted by Mark Webber himself. Fantastic guys, not bad for number two driver. Cheers. Yes, well remember the front wing gate. Yes, we also remember the multi-21 gate. But still the evidence base of Red Bull seeing Mark only as a second driver is not nearly as large as for example in Schumacher and Ferrari case. And now when we've discussed the main reasons of hate, let's talk about how did Sebastian manage to cope up with all of this pressure. And here I should say that Sebastian sort of enjoyed his position, enjoyed being this F1 villain. Of course it didn't match with his personality, but still he didn't miss a chance to troll the public to show them that despite all the feelings he is still number one, we all remember his finger. And I guess he even managed to use this hate this condemnation to fuel his performance. Also, he didn't miss a chance to show some cockiness. The multi-21 gate was completely unnecessary. This overtake didn't mean anything for Sebastian in his driver's championship. And his later explanation that it was a sort of revenge for Brazil 2012 was quite awkward. But still, I wouldn't say that Sebastian fitted his inherited role perfectly. He just didn't have a choice and had to cope with all the pressure. But even there, he managed to show his great and charming personality, lots of jokes, some of them were simple, some of them were quite intellectual, some of them were pretty smart actually, always smiling, always signing autographs. He managed to polarize people even with his persona, with his image. So it's no wonder why people changed their mind later on once again, but we will talk about it in the last video of this trilogy. And the last season that we will cover today will be 2014, the last Sebastian's season in Red Bull, the last season in the Red Bull era, and it didn't go as well for him. He was pretty heavily outscored by Daniel Ricciardo. Quite a significant 71 points differential, and the main difference is, of course, three wins to zero. But in terms of other stats, actually, the situation is not so horrible and I will not call it elimination, but still, the difference was there. And the difference occurred in most valuable moments. Daniel Ricciardo was just able to deliver when it really mattered. And at that time, it was a complete nonsense. Newcomer in the team outperforms reigning, defending world champion. But from the height of foregone years, I actually want to defend Sebastian. In that season he faced pretty similar problem that Lewis Hamilton faced in previous season. On the one side young and hungry talented driver and on the other side a car that no longer competes for the championship. We remember that 2014 is the start of Mercedes era, they were just dominating everyone. So when a person who is used to a constant chances for victory now finds himself in a car that is not able to win, he faces a huge mental downfall. But on the other side, the task for up-and-coming young driver pretty much doesn't change. He still wants to show himself as best as possible in comparison with multi-times world champion. And as we know, Sebastian Vettel was not able to hide from this scenario, quite a similar thing happened to him in 2019, but again we will talk about it in the third Sebastian Vettel video. And for now the current video will end, we will leave Sebastian after 8 of his 16 F1 years. He is leaving Red Bull, he is transferring into Ferrari and he is dreaming about making Ferrari great again. And I am dreaming about making my channel great. So please leave your like, leave your dislike, subscribe to the channel, ring the notification bell and tell me in the comments. Did you enjoy this new sort of podcast format? Also feel free to argue or disagree with me or to supplement any point. Set and go!
tough I just need to feel like the end's in sight for me But let's be really real Anxiety can foggy all this stuff I've been feeling weird I can't seem to focus good enough Nothing's really clear Sometimes it could be a little tough I just need to feel like the end's in sight for me But let's be really real Anxiety can foggy yeah. all this stuff it sucks when you finally feel like giving up oh god no luck everything feels like you're sticky stuck i'm lost handcuffed to the bed where i sleep don't give a fuck can't stop unplug feeling overwhelmed i think i've had enough uh, gotta find a way to get some energy gotta find someone who's a good friend of me i need purpose to make it all worth it i'm still searching and i'm still learning i want a life that's filled with memories not a life with regret in front of me i need focus to keep me from hopeless psychosis if i keep moping i got nightmares in my head i feel that the thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper